Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar. First and foremost, I hope everyone is and their families are healthy and safe during these absolutely crazy times that we're going through today. Um, today, as you know, we're going to be discussing the economy, the Fed, interest rates, the stock market, and the bond market. And um, it takes great pleasure, and I'm very pleased to announce a very longtime great friend of mine. Lizanne Saunders, who is one of the top investment strategists on the street and who is the senior vice president and chief analyst uh, investment uh, strategist for Charles Schwab. Lizanne, hi, how hi, are you? Hi, Tom. Good, how are you? Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Great to see you. You too. Um, so look, I guess the easy thing here is just to go right at it and look at uh, a 30,000 foot view of the economy. And, sure. uh, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, um, you had economists that were all over the place. They, we were going to have a V-shaped recovery. We we're, we're going to have a U-shaped recovery, a small U-shaped recovery, an L-shaped recovery. And then you have uh, coined the rolling W recovery. Yeah. Would you like to talk to us about that? Sure. So I think, and, and quite frankly, depending on what industry, what sector, what company you're looking at, you probably can find an example of just about every letter in the alphabet in terms of what recovery is look like. Obviously, there are companies and industries that are facing truly an existential threat to their survivability. And you might label some of those an L and others that really didn't suffer much at all. So there really was no shape associated with it. But I think the unique nature of this particular crisis, starting as a health crisis, becoming an economic crisis, simply because we were forced, not just in the United States, but globally, to shut the entire economy down. And then the Fed stepping in to try to prevent, and I think successfully so far, prevent what was an economic crisis from becoming a financial system crisis. But the, the nature of a health-driven economic cycle here one where the virus is still with us, I think means that we're going to have fits and starts in economic behavior. And I think when we first started to open things back up again in the mid-May timeframe, I think the narrative was that as long as there was not a government mandated shutdown again, either at the federal level or even at the state and local level, that the economy would be fine. But what we're seeing now is we're still at the mercy of human behavior, of the fear factor, of small business decisions, where you can have fits and starts in economic activity, even absent any mandated shutdown in the economy. And I, I think that's the environment we're, we're in right now, where you get a resurgence in the virus, even if decisions are not made to shut things down, down, you know, people sort of step back and you see it in mobility data. And, and I think that's the environment we're in. And, and maybe even after the point of, of a vaccine, I don't know that that necessarily means we're smooth sailing. So I think it's going to be a very choppy pattern here. Yeah, I, the vaccine, it, it, some people think that people are just going to be lining up for that vaccine, you know, right off the bat. And uh, the people I talk to say, hey, I don't want to be a hero here. I don't want to be first in line for a vaccine. And I, I think uh, we talk about this a lot in here that I think a therapeutic would be far more yeah. important and more of a confidence builder um, and waiting for the right vaccine, meaning that, hey, if I get this, I know I'll hopefully maybe take an inhaler or like a Tamiflu and not die. I, I think um, you're which, absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, both are probably ideal, but a, a vaccine absent a treatment what we don't realize is that we're going to get the announcement, everyone's going to cheer, and then there are more follow-on questions that at that point there won't be answers to than leading into it. You know, you just look at the history of vaccines, everything from efficacy, uh, availability, um, the, the speed with which it can be brought actually to market, how quickly mm -hmm. the quantities needed. And then to your point, Tom, the decisions that individuals make as to whether they're willing to take it or not. So I, I agree. I actually think there's so much focus on a vaccine, but a, a really dominant therapeutic, I think, would be maybe even more of a game changer, in, at least in the near term. Yeah, unless, of course, it's the Russian vaccine and then everything is good. <laughs> I, I uh, certainly wouldn't get in line for that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, 
obviously we realize that the virus is the one that really knows this, but is it possible that we have actually bottomed in the economy and that this could be on record as one of the shortest recessions that we've really ever had? So I, I do think it is possible we bottomed in the economy, but keep in mind that the level at which we bottomed in you know, quarter over quarter annualized GDP terms of a decline of almost 33% is unprecedented, save for the Great Depression era. And even then, we didn't calculate GDP the same way. So it's not really an apples to apples comparison. Mm. So certainly suffice it to say in the post-depression environment, I mean, we haven't had a decline anywhere near this much. What I think is, is sort of fascinating about what we're living through right now with regard to the recession. We know when it started, the NBER came out uh, pretty quickly, fastest ever, and you know, started uh, dated the start in February. That surprised a lot of people because the economic data was still good then, but you have to remember, and a lot of people don't realize this, that NBER, which is the bureau that is the official arbiter of recessions, when they conclude we're in one, they go back to effectively the peak in the data and say that's the start point. Now, the same thing happens on the back end of a recession. Once they believe that we're out of it, they go and they look at the trough in the data. But here's the rub this time. And I don't know whether it's going to be different this time. I just think it's an interesting thing to think about. I'm a big believer, Tom, as you know, that rate of change and direction tends to matter more than level when it comes to economic data. You know, stock market tends to focus more on good, you know, better versus worse as opposed to good versus bad. But when the level of compression is so deep, I wonder if the NBER is going to be more hesitant than they might otherwise to say, okay, the recession ended, you know, in the second quarter because of how deep the hole is from which we have to climb. I, I think if they do that, there is some risk of an early 80s kind of situation where you get a double dip uh, recession, or mm. maybe they just decide to wait a bit longer uh, to date the, the end. Um, you know, I don't know, but we know this is unprecedented in terms of the, both the level and the rate of change in the data. And I tell you, I wouldn't want to be a member of their, what they call the business cycle dating committee. I think it was easy on the front end. You shut an economy down, the recession begins then. Right. I think it's going to be much tougher on the yeah. back end. Nobody's around the last time we had a double dip. Well, I was, you were. Oh, I, no, I'm saying, yeah, I guess I was, wasn't I? <laughs> you were around in the early 80s. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't quite in the business yet. Uh, that started in 86. But yeah, I that was not a fun time that. for sure. No, it was um, not. But that was long and deep. I mean, you know, I, I, I think back to prior to the Great Recession, how we had two uh, nine-month recessions, which was, I think, uh, November two th uh, March to November 2001, and then we had 90 to 91. Right. And um, it, 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 they were, what, how many years apart, too, if you think about it. Right. That. I um, think that's what makes that this experience so unique is that the and, and maybe helps to explain the perceived disconnect between what's been going on in the stock market and what's been going on in the true. economy. I think both with a stock market decline, but also an economic decline. Uh, but let's talk about the stock market for a minute. Price matters, of course. You know, when you have a 34% drop in the market, that's that's jarring. But time matters as well. And I think more protracted in length, either bear markets or recessions, tends to have as much of a psychological impact on either investors or consumers. When it's condensed, it may lessen the impact um, a little bit because you don't have that time factor. You just have the, the price factor or the economic decline factor. And that is what is particularly unique about this environment is we've, we've lived through now a full market cycle, maybe even a full economic cycle in a matter of months. And Five months. That's never happened before. Ever. You know, it's very jarring mentally. It for is. Sure. Uh, I mean, and, but, although but I some think it would be more jarring if it was protracted. Right. quarter after quarter just, of this kind of just like, horrible, like, horrible economic like a, data. Uh, yeah. water torture, just drip, 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 drip. Right. Uh, this like happened 07 to so that people, thankfully, in a lot of cases, couldn't react to, to, right. the, bet, to the betterment of themselves, you know? That's right, exactly. Uh, they, there, sure. there was less time to panic inappropriately. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I remember um, 
March 9th, 2009, uh, around two o'clock in the afternoon when, I mean, people were just thrown in the towel. Sure. And that was it. And that was that the was ultimate it. bottom. Yep. And of, and of right. course, and of, co of course, you call the bottom of uh, the recession, which was June, right? Uh, J June, the recession ended. I, well, it was May, and I said, I think the recession's over or om almost over. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't any brilliant prescience on my part. It's just, again, when it comes to the stock market and the economy, the market tends to find its inflection point first. It sort of sniffs out the turn in the economy. And you had started to see a little bit of that turn in the data in conjunction with a market that had bottomed in March. And that you sort of just put the puzzle pieces together and mm -hmm. suggested that the worst was over for the economy, which means that's the bottom. And that's when a recession end is dated. Of course, in the market, the market was rallying four months before the recession officially, officially ended. In you know fact, what, with the exception, you know, Tom, you mentioned 2001. Going back in the kind of modern era, the post-World War II era, if you look at both beginnings of recessions and ends of recessions that have had bear markets associated with them, which is most cases, in every case except the end of the 2000 to 2002 bear market, in every case, the stock market led the economy. In other words, the stock market moved down first before the recession started, and the stock market moved up first before the recession ended. The only exception again was a one. And maybe that was because the recession, we probably wouldn't even have had a recession were it not for the collapse in the stock market. That sort of caused the recession. So the recession was mild because it was only concentrated in the stock market. Right. So the I guess recession that was when NASDAQ ended, in, in, 19, in 2000, I think peak to trough was down 50%. And I think NASDAQ 100 was down 80%. Even more. So it took longer to work out the excess in the stock market. Uh, you know, the stock market bottomed a year after the recession ended, but that's the exception, not the rule. Right. And, and going into 2009, I remember, and, and this is the, you know, uh, is about what's going on now when people look Main Street versus Wall Street, but um, we bottomed in 2009 and all the way through until, you know, 2000, December of 2010, the stock market rallied almost 60% right. and the unemployment rate was stuck high nines or 10%. Here's, th th this is such an important subject because it not only brings up what I already mentioned, the whole notion of better or worse tends to matter more than good or bad, market being a leading indicator, but importantly, there are leading indicators, there are coincident indicators, and there are lagging indicators. The stock market is a leading indicator. The unemployment rate is not only a lagging indicator, it's one of the most lagging indicators. So the problem is there are two very popular things we pay attention to. The problem is connecting them at a moment in time. And it is always the case that when a recession starts and a bear market starts, the unemployment rate is usually at its low point. Think about it. Market peaked in February. Recession began in February. The unemployment rate was 3.5%. March of 09, as you mentioned, was 10% still going higher. That's because it's a lagging indicator. It generally is continuing to go up after the market has already bottomed. So understanding the relationship between a leading indicator and a lagging indicator is really crucial to understanding what at times seems like a complete disconnect that makes no sense. We're, and we're at 10.2% 10, 10 unemployment right now, right? We are. And there you go. And we just hit an all time. And, oh, and whether it's accurate at 10.2, that's the other. Wow. Well, and that's the other tricky thing about all the economic data in this environment. I mean, it's getting a bit better because the economy is effectively opened back up, but just the bureaus that calculate all this economic data, how do you do it when everything is shut down? I mean, there's so many facets that go into how the unemployment rate is calculated, how payrolls are calculated, business birth and death model. And that was, you throw a huge monkey wrench in that when you just have a complete shutdown in the economy. So that's why economists have sort of been all over the map. And right, and then and then you throw in the PPP loans on top of that, which right. is you know a facade, if you will. Uh, I think it was there. I think it personally did a great job, and that um, the problem is it was only for so many months. And guess what? Right. It, it, what happens when it runs out? Which and me, not not every small business was able to access it. Um, some found the process so confusing that they sort of just gave up. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the enhanced unemployment insurance, which, well, what, which ran out. That, that brings up a great uh, question about Fed stimulus and, and 
And I mean, look, unlike 2008, they came in guns a blazing. And they sure did. I mean, they didn't wait around. And frankly, and, so did the government. So did Congress. I mean, the CARES Act was was passed very, very quickly without sort of the need for a market riot after the riot that after yeah after the <laughs> February to March riot. Right. But you remember TARP. You, you know, it wasn't. Oh my God, they didn't get their act together. Points, they, right. Oh, yeah, that was so that was it, like, that didn't have to happen. I think both monetary authorities and fiscal authorities knew. Yeah that speed and size was crucial. We and, actually you know, have learned incredible. from the past. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, dare I say, they, everybody uh, did, a, did a very good job and we are where we are here today. However, that also brings up the fact that, you know, when do you stop the stimulus? We got, um, and this is just anecdotal, but when you go out, if you go out to a restaurant or, or clients or friends that um, uh, own businesses that they can't find employees now because right. they're getting paid more to stay at home. It really is tricky because you have you have those that are definitely they need that uh, because there's nowhere to go, and then you have the others that, well, hey, guess what? I got a job to go back to, but I'm getting paid more not to work. It's so, that, although that that ended at the end of July, of course, and now you've got Congress uh, kind of doing what they do best, which is you know fight and. Uh, right not come up with something. So whether they are able to cobble together something, we'll, we'll see. But that's extremely important. And you're, you're absolutely right. Through the period of the enhanced unemployment insurance, that's extra $600 a week on top of whatever the state benefit was, 60, 60 to 65% of recipients were bringing in more money than they were when they were working. So that was a disincentive to return uh, to work. However, here's the difference now. Not only did that supplement expire, but since that point in time, since the beginning of all of that enhanced unemployment, the stimulus checks being set out, the vast majority of those that were unemployed, call it back in the you know, April, May timeframe, believed they were only temporarily employed. The problem in recent months, even though the headline numbers have been generally better than expected with jobs, temporary layoffs have been going down, permanent job losses have been going up. And now we don't have that enhanced unemployment insurance. So I think those two factors change the landscape uh, now versus then. Another interesting fact is if you look at the period of stimulus, started with the checks given out and then the enhanced unemployment insurance, if you break the population into the unemployed recipients of that stimulus versus the employed. So they were obviously not receiving this. Then you look at what their consumption pattern was. The consumption of the unemployed receiving those enhanced benefits sunk more during the downturn, but once those benefits kicked in, the consumption went up much faster, much higher to sort of pre-pandemic levels where the employed cohort has not returned its consumption, which of course then begs the question, without it, what's the wherewithal for the unemployed cohort to continue to consume? And if the employed cohort for some reason decides they're gonna now start consuming, is it enough to offset? And you know, Walmart reported numbers yesterday and that's one of the things they talked about. They said, look, we had a great quarter, but we think a lot of it was driven by the, the stimulus and we're starting that's to That's why it sold off too. Paper. I mean, yeah. The you know, because all of a sudden, okay, this is a one and done thing. What's interesting too is um, what you were just uh, talking about is that the savings rate went through the roof yeah, and retail sales went through the roof. Right. And there's your perfect example of what you were just talking about. It's just now, now it's sort of the, almost the make or break or the, or the sort of show me moment where we can really get a sense absent another quick fix by Congress, we can get a sense of how much of that surge in retail sales was the combination of not just the stimulus checks and enhanced unemployment, but of course, pent up demand that comes from three months of us being, you know, quarantined and, and in lockdown. So I think that that uh, you know cabin fever aspect was a factor, and then the income support was a factor. Now I think this will be the tell. Going forward. Um, uh, yes, it, for the next couple of months, absent a new package from C Congress, how stable the economic footing is without that support. But, well, we, we'll, t we'll talk about this later. We are in a, an election year. 
So I hadn't noticed. <laughs> so uh, got a lot of questions about um, you know the printing of money, the you know the fact that we are now at one hundred percent, one hundred times GDP. Um, and that's just federal government debt, right. which is 100% of GDP. There's right. still, there's also state household and local debt. debt, there's household debt, there's corporate debt, there's financial se sector debt. That's, by the way, 360% of GDP. So All right, I'm feeling chew on good. that number. I'm feeling really good right now. <laughs> um, but are we becoming Japan? Um, I don't think we're becoming uh, Japan. I think, believe it or not, uh, there, there's, there's often uh, concern expressed about the demographics of our country, but my goodness, we have such superior demographics relative to Japan. I mean, you know, the age of that population, the support that can be provided by young people for the older, I mean, it's just night and day versus ours. I mean, the good news is, is that you know, the, the millennium generation, sort of the echo boom, which is a, a blend of, of a two different uh, uh, sort of age categories, um, way outnumbers the baby boomers. And so we actually have, certainly in the developed world, a pretty decent demographic uh, platform. Uh, so I don't really worry so much about that. What I do worry about is that, although I don't think this horrific deficit situation. We're looking at somewhere between 3.7 and $4 trillion just this year. So the budget deficit we're running is running on a monthly basis at numbers that used to be bad for an entire year, let alone for a single month. And of course, debt, federal government debt, the piece that's 100% of GDP, that's the cumulative effect of running deficits. Now, a lot of people think that that combined with what the Fed has done with money printing, quantitative easing, is an inflation accident waiting to happen. Um, we have not had that, that view. Uh, there's very little velocity of money. So yes, the Fed's pumping tons of money into the financial system, but it's not coming out through the lending channels and picking up velocity in the economy. That's why we haven't had an inflation problem. On the you know, deficit and debt side, I also don't think you have a near-term risk of inflation. To me, the problem with a high and rising burden of debt is not some future moment in time crisis, but a simmering crisis over time in getting an economy to grow at anything resembling a healthy pace. That's sort of, and that's where I think we're kind of like Japan. I think that's been the impact on Japan. They haven't had trouble financing their debt. They have mostly domestic holders of their, their debt, but their economy has not grown much at all. And but their stock also, market is actually still hasn't hit the 1989 high. Uh, so yeah, it's so extraordinary. It was, it was almost 40,000 back in 1989. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it, and let's not forget demographics, you're so right. I mean, is the locomotive of any economy. And the fact that we have immigration, I mean, not too many folks immigrate to Japan. Um, That's right. And when, when uh, you have to sell more adult diapers and baby diapers, you know, you've got a real problem. Good point. Huge demographic problem. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I believe even by the uh, year of 2050, we will be younger than China. I think. Uh, I think you're right. And I, I think that's the peril of what had been their one child policy. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Two people getting older for one younger person. You know, yeah. I, I'm not, I'm surprised there, there are many smart people there, but that was not very forward thinking. Uh, I think they, um, I think they changed that, what, maybe three, four years ago? Yeah. 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 So I think uh, a uh, stalwart in this economy in the past five months has been just surprisingly housing. Yeah. And I mean, compared to what we went through in the Great Recession, it's yeah. just a complete shift. Um, uh, uh, there are a lot of factors, of course, um, but a few things have happened just in the last few weeks or a month. And that is rates have ticked up a little bit, which is, I know for you and I and a lot of our clients, is, oh my God, it went from three to 3.2%. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the roof is caving in. But um, lumber prices are up 50%. Yeah. And, and I think I, I saw a figure that for a home of $400,000, it adds uh, $14,000 to, the, to the base price, if not more. Uh, from lumber. From lumber. Yeah, unless of course you're building in a hurricane zone like Florida. Oh yeah, and like it's all Florida. concrete. And it's concrete. You got to worry yeah. about. 
But, you know, I think, uh, look, I think in general, the housing story is a very positive one. I think it will be a driver of economic growth. I think we've had a dearth of investments in in new homes that the demographics make a lot of sense. We're seeing increased household formation, but it's not without a bit of a rub. So what we're seeing is that uh, delinquencies, mortgage delinquencies, clearly by the cohort, sadly, that have lost their jobs, that have lost that income support are up, but we're still in that period of moratorium. So the question is when that moratorium ends, assuming we don't see an improved economic environment with job growth really kicking into gear to absorb some of those people, inevitably some of those delinquencies will become defaults and foreclosures. Yeah. It's, been, it's been held off by virtue of the moratorium and allowing then the other components of strength in the housing market to, to shine really brightly. Yeah. It's starting uh, to percolate up though. We'll, we'll, it, and, and a lot of it, of course, is what we're all living and breathing now is, is you know, people living in small rental apartments, if they're now working from home and they're trying to keep young kids entertained and they just say, wait a minute, what are we doing? And if I can work remotely, I'm out of here. I'm going to the suburbs. I want a backyard. I need a home office. I want to have a place where my kids can, uh, to, you know, be in school in, you know, inside. And it's so these are some powerful shifts that I think bode well for housing. But there is that near term yeah. rub of of the uh, delinquencies. Yeah, it's like uh, the subprime lending for cars is, you know, I, I think at a peak, although. Yeah. Um, repossessing a car is far easier than foreclosing on a property. Yeah, I don't think that represents the same kind of economic calamity. Plus the, the fact that we don't have anywhere near the leverage in the financial system and there aren't, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars of derivatives tied to this stuff. I mean, that yeah. that truly was, as you and I talked about a lot in 06 and 07, that was literally and figuratively a house of cards. Yep. Um, I, I don't see the same ripple effects by any means. No, I think we far, could have problems far. in delinquencies, both auto and home, but it's not taking the uh, global economy down. Yeah, we, we entered this from a, a, a the strength side rather than the weakness. Absolutely, side, for sure. financial that system is in, in yeah is in pretty good shape. You know, the the banks came through the recent Fed stress tests. Um, maybe not quite with flying colors, but but in quite sound shape. Yeah. And that is the probably the most important difference between this crisis and the financial crisis. A huge difference, thank God. Yep. Um, I mean, that crisis was in the financial system. This was a health crisis that became an economic crisis. And I think the Fed has done a, uh, a great job at keeping it from becoming a financial system crisis. Yeah. But that last crisis was was born and raised in the financial system. Oh, there's great uh, lending vehicles and, and fixed income vehicles, right? God, it's a crazy time. It's amazing how you look back and just say, how did we get Why? ourselves into this? But I know. We're human. It happened. Yeah, you know what, greed. fear and greed and yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if we look at the stock market, so we've just officially now begun a bull market. Well, we um, began it at March 23rd, but we can now say that say that was it a new is, bull right, market. Right. New high. It takes a new because high. Because we hit a new high, yes. Right. Yep. So, okay, officially, yeah. if you own the right stocks, if you have the five or six stocks that have been running and yeah, controlling exactly. this market, which we can get to. However, I think what else is interesting is that we've hit, um, which is worrisome, no doubt, the multiple right now is roughly 23, 24 times. I mean, we're approaching where we were in, you know, what year that was. Yep. In, uh, in 99, and yep. I, you already said this, and I'm going to say, is it different this time? I, we know better. I can't believe I just said it, but that back then, the 10-year treasury was at 6%, right. and we were at 27 times or something like that, I think. Today, we're at a 70 basis points, and we're at the same rate. So is this acceptable? And short rates are at zero, with the Fed promising to keep them there for at least the next year or two. Yes. So that is different. And that's why it, maybe it's not a stretch. You, you know, Tom, you've seen my table of, of about 15 different valuation metrics, including your standard PE ratio, but also uh, longer term metrics like 
very popular one, Schiller's Cape, cyclically adjusted PE. Another one that's gotten a lot of attention recently, the Buffett model, which just measures the market cap of all stocks trading, not just the S&P, divided by the size of the U.S. economy. And the former just exceeded the latter. And mm. Warren Buffett has said forever that that's sort of his favorite valuation model. So that says the market's crazy overvalued, as do traditional PE ratios. But there are valuation metrics like risk premiums, equity risk premiums, which basically compare um, equities to treasury yields, which you talked about, to corporate bond yields. You've got other metrics like the rule of 20 that takes inflation into consideration, the Fed model, and those legitimate valuation metrics. They're not just newly invented to justify today's valuations. Actually say the market is quite inexpensive because of that incredibly low discount rate that we use to discount future earnings and future cash flows. The problem that I see right now is that we can calculate the forward PE. I just have no sense whatsoever whether that expected E is anything resembling reality. We have had a record number of companies just with completely withdraw guidance to Wall Street, just say, we have no idea. Well, if the companies themselves can't provide guidance, the analysts are flying blind. I think what happened in kind of the March, April timeframe is analysts just said, you know what, we're going to err on the side of just slashing the heck out of estimates. So what happened with the quarter that is just finishing? Companies beat estimates by a record degree. Earnings are still down 33% year over year, but the beat rate was a record and the amount by which they beat is a record. You don't think they do that on purpose, do you? Yeah, well, I, they just, analysts just had no idea. So they, yeah. they right, maybe rightly so, erred on the side of cutting too much. Well, we went from but what? now they're we were... really lofty for next year. I, who well, knows we whether. Do what, 165 bucks uh, per share in the S&P going into 20 or 170, I think some people had. Yeah. And then I think- Goldman Sachs, which, you know, they've just been all they over cut the place. Too much. They went all the way down to 70 bucks. Yeah, they went to 70. And then and we sort of settled up. in at around 125 and we're yeah. going to beat that. Yeah. But, you know, there are, by, by third quarter of next year, so at the halfway point, it's expected based on consensus, which again, is not really consensus driven by a lot of company guidance, but just happens to be the average of what analysts are flying bind and trying to do, is that we will have every single sector in positive territory, in every case, double digits, and I think four or five sectors in triple digit year over year growth terms. I, I, I hope that that's accurate. Mm. I hope that that understates the recovery we're going to see. But let's just say it's, it's uncertain. So whether we can even rely on a forward P, but here's what I often, you know this, Tom, what I always say about valuations, any valuation metric. We think of a PE as quantifiable. We know what the PE is. We generally have a number for the E. If it's trailing earnings, it's an actual number. If it's forward earnings, maybe it's not accurate, but there is a consensus number. So we think of it as this quantifiable metric. The reality is that valuation is as much a sentiment indicator as anything else. There are times like 99 and 2000 that investors were willing to pay nosebleed valuations without regard to the validity of the E. There are times like March of 09 where the S&P bottomed at a single digit multiple. Investors didn't want to pay anything for the prospect for earnings. So it's a sentiment indicator as much as anything else. And we're in a momentum, high optimism, uh, arguably in some corners of the market, sort of frothy environment. And so valuations just sort of take a backseat to those other forces. Well, that's funny you said that because I'm thinking back again to um, March of 2000 um, when um, nobody wanted a value stock. Everything had to be dot-com, including pets.com. We, we know about that story. And lo and Behold, in the next two years, as NASDAQ cratered. Yep. NASDAQ 100 got uh, no. obliterated. Obliterated, and, but we had that natural rotation back into value. Yep. And value did double digits two years in a row. Now, we are at a historic moment right now where growth has outdone value for over 10 years. I believe it's been 10 years. It's yep. crazy, right? Um, and I think that eventually we're going to run into this. Now, whether it's a therapeutic or a vaccine, I think that's where, you know, we tried that in May, excuse me, not May, was it June where we had the 
the uh, recovery stocks coming back really yeah. quickly. From mid-May until June 8th, you had that sort of classic Huge. cyclicals yeah, surge. And that's about that as long as it lasted. Right. <laughs> and then we that go falters. right back into this. And of course, you know, we are all about rebalancing and all about, you know, having a properly diversified portfolio. And, you know, the rule of th thumb is, okay, you're a little bit overweight in growth. You know, you start to scrape a little, put it into value, and its growth just keeps going higher. And well, uh, here's, here's my, my thinking on growth versus value. I think it's really important, maybe especially in an environment like this, and I would argue was also the case in 2002 when the tech bust finally ended and the market bottomed. There is often an, a big difference between the fundamental or the characteristic or the factor of growth and value versus the index constituents of growth and value. And I often get quizzical looks when I say that from people. So I use a couple of examples typically. So think about when the tech bust finally ended. The market had bottomed, the S&P had bottomed, the NASDAQ had bottomed, the NASDAQ 100 bottomed, at, I think down 80%. So this was sort of the October 02 timeframe. At that point, if you wanted to look for deep value, you wanted to buy the tech stocks. Yes. Russell hadn't moved them into the, the value indexes, but that's where you found deep value. Yep. And you killed it if you had played a value game at that time. Now, if you had said, to, if somebody had said, I'm buying value without providing that context, and people say, oh, I'm buying the utilities and the you know, telecoms, and you wouldn't have done well. Those did fairly well during the downturn, but that's where you found value. Conversely, fast forward to today, uh, a classic value uh, sector is the utilities sector. But because so much money has chased utilities by yield-starved investors, they're all still housed in the value indexes, but they don't offer any value. Yeah. So I, th I continue to think that the factor, the fundamental of quality growth will define leadership, but that doesn't mean you just blindly buy the growth indexes. You just look for the factors across segments. In fact, that quality factor, strong balance sheet, strong free That's cash right. flow. Um, if you look, I saw a recent study that looked at quality factors, consistent quality factors, and applied them to all 11 sectors. In every single sector, the higher quality companies have outperformed the lower quality companies. Yeah. So I think the quality factor is the most important thing to focus on versus just static labels of growth versus value or even at the, the sector level. I think that's what's going to be a winning, continue to be a winning strategy in this very unique environment. So furthering that, going uh, out and looking at um, asset class or sectors, if you will, where do you think going forward, and I know, who knows, right, with the virus and what have you, but if you could further that a little bit more, like do you look at the healthcare sector as is an opportune time at this point? Yeah, so I think, when I think about um, the sectors that will be sort of dominate the future, the sort of post-COVID, post-pandemic future of the economy, um, I, I don't know whether we've talked about this, Tom, recently, but I, I do believe that we are at the beginning of what may be a pretty important secular shift in the, the sort of structure of our economy, uh, going from one that was heavily consumer spending, heavily services driven, and somewhat by default, because I believe those will compress as a share of the economy, I think what we're gonna see pick up a lot of that slack is finally the investment side of the economy. And healthcare is sort of right at the heart of that. We, we've learned through this the need to invest in healthcare, whether it's supply chains, whether it's bringing therapeutics to market quicker, whether it's needing to create vaccines more, more quickly, an investment in healthcare infrastructure. We know there will be continued investments in technology, maybe even ramped, knowing how important that is to the economy and efficiency and productivity. We're long overdue for investments in infrastructure. We're seeing it in housing. And the good news is those segments of the economy employ many more people than the segments most hurt in the economy right now. That doesn't mean the transition is going to be uh, smooth. I think it's going to be bumpy, 
But I think the long-term story is a fairly optimistic one, which continues to put healthcare and tech sort of in the catbird seat long-term and maybe things housing related. But I also think that from a sort of value perspective, I think financials are sort of interesting um, as a value play because they got so crushed in the early phase of this uh, COVID situation. In fact, financials is the only sector right now on which we have an outperform rating. It was a controversial move at the really? time we did it. Yeah, um, but we felt that th they were o oversold based on concerns about, okay, we're in another economic crisis. This is gonna kill the financials without, I think, enough looking under the hood. And I think coming through the stress test helped alleviate some of those concerns that, you know, the financial system's in pretty decent shape here and valuations got so reasonable. But again, I really think that quality factors will define leadership more than just making a blanket, you know, sector decision. But when I think of segments of the economy as opposed to stock market sectors, I think technology and healthcare um, really are in the sweet spot. Well, you know, that also brings up the fact that there are a lot of individual investors or pro portfolio managers such as ourselves that um, are, you know, we lower the duration, our bonds are coming due in the next two years. We do have longer duration bonds, thankfully, but, or bond funds, but it's gonna pose a big problem. And we're not alone in this. Everybody is in this together, whether you have a CD that's maturing or you have a bond that's being called or preferred. I mean, we have been going into preferreds and, 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 and converts and some high yield and, you know, through, through uh, some mutual funds. But this is where the Fed has created a scenario where it's taken the savers okay. and thrown them under the bus and said, That's right. hey, you got to eat dog food. Sorry, we're, we're elsewhere. We're over here. Which and obviously wasn't the point of what the Fed did. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but it's, but it's had it, the effect. It, yes, it's, and the effect is it's unfortunate that, and, and this happened in, if you remember, 15 and 16, there were a lot of yield chasers. Um, and they, yep. they really got burnt going into like MLPs and things like that. And they might have gotten their dividend, but the stock was down 50%. So it's very precarious and we have to be very extremely careful, but we, we need that cash flow too. So that's where, you know, from a sector standpoint of view or an asset class standpoint of view, you know, that's where the value is. You know, you talk about utilities. I mean, the, the multiples are, you know, where they are right now on, on utilities. But, you know, you look at the, the telecoms and, and, and even some healthcare, you're getting, you know, three to 5% yeah. high quality dividends in there. And that's the key is quality and dividends. I think too many investors, they'll just sort of scroll or do some screening for the highest dividend yield without regard to the underlying fundamentals of the company. Because often a stratospheric dividend yield is actually sending a very dire message about the health of the company. But there are ways to look for both a quality company and a reasonably high dividend yield that is likely to be maintained. Um, the company might even have the ability to increase that dividend. So it, it needs to be that combination as opposed to just, let's just reverse rank by dividend yield and then you know pick right. the highest uh, names. That doesn't tend to be a, a winning strategy. I just think investors have to remember that um, in the bond market, you know, a lot of fear about a bond bear market if yields start to move up, but bond bear markets look entirely different than equity bear markets. Um, it's pretty rare to actually lose uh, money. And depending on how you structure duration, whether you do ladders or barbell, you know, you can take advantage of a rising yield environment by maybe shortening duration and you're having your Treasury securities mature more quickly, and then you're rolling into higher yielding. That said, the notion that, you know, that, that we're all sitting here with a bunch of risk-free 5% coupon bonds, and we're only sharing them with our best clients. I mean, that's just the, the world that did has you, I'm been I'm sorry, did you say created. coupon bonds? Yeah, it's coupon, coupon. I don't know the what accent is telling. Yeah. Flipping coupons, 5% yeah, unis. Coupon. Yep. Um, but, you know, there are, there are ways to pick up a uh, yield. Now, you know, remember the, 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 the Fed strategy back in the financial crisis and any central bank strategy in compressing rates is to try to stimulate risk taking in the real economy. The pr 
problem is that it stimulated a lot of risk taking and stimulated a lot of inflation. It's just all been in asset markets, not in the real economy. And that's been the unfortunate sort of outcome of this unique experiment in monetary policy. Yeah, it truly is unique. Uh, and then T, which uh, a lot of people want to just see continue for sure. Yeah. Um, so you talked about healthcare, and I'm going to segue a little bit into the political end. And this, okay. um, I think we have an election coming up, I believe. And you know, where does this go? I, I, I mean, I look at healthcare, and I hear all these things, and I, and I think it, from a political standpoint of view, I think the market has um, looked at and, and felt okay with the pick for vice president mm -hmm. um, that uh, it was really, you know, a nothing burger right there for now. I think the market is priced in uh, or is um, palatable for a, if, 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 a if, if Biden should win, that they have not priced in, maybe you can tell me I'm wrong, I don't think they have priced in a sweep. I think they still yeah, I mean, the you know, we're, we're, we all speculate when we try to say what the market has priced in as if it's this, you know, singular thing. and We just need to divine what it believes about politics or anything else. I mean, there's always a gazillion forces that are impacting markets. And I think too much attention, quite frankly, gets put on election outcomes in the lead into an election. And it happens in every cycle. And I think the reality is what, what actually impacts both the economy and the market is uh, usually has much less to do with politics than we tend to, to think. Now, we're already seeing some behavior in the markets reflect what we're seeing in polls. It's kind of under the hood behavior in terms of the types of stocks that are doing well versus not. There are a couple of firms that have put together sort of Biden portfolios and Trump portfolios actually picking stocks that are perceived to do well based on the policy platforms. And it goes up and down with the poll. So there is some trading that I think is happening. Generally, you don't start to see meaningful movement that can be maybe pinpointed until the post Labor Day environment. But the real factor is sort of twofold. One, it's not just about what happens in the White House, but of course, as you said, the makeup of Congress. I think the market, and this is speculation, is probably fairly calm in a scenario where if Biden wins, but we see we maintain a split Congress, then basically off the table are uh, significant tax increases off the table are major changes to the regulatory environment. And I think the market probably, there's plenty of other things for all of us to worry about. A sweep, um, that probably isn't priced in. But even there, you know, we've had sweeps in the past where there's been a dominant policy platform and you get a shift in power yet the economic environment is not supportive of whatever maybe the first priority was. So the big reality is even in a sweep scenario, if at the time of the election, the Biden campaign is still running on, you know, higher taxes on corporations or upper income, if the economy is in really bad shape, that is probably not going to be number one priority. I think probably the spending side will be the number one priority. So in any environment, it's the economic reality of the day that defines what in the campaign in bullet points um, ends up being a priority when they're actually sitting in their offices. That's a great point. Um, actually, it happened in 08 with, uh, with the Obama, Obama. Obama had a super majority. And right. guess what happened? It was three or four years before tax okay. rates on the wealthy went up because the economic environment wasn't supportive of it at the time. So. This is true. Um, you know, we're so polarized right now. As you know, Tom, what we try to do is just leave the noise aside and just say, all right, what, what, what are the policy implications and what are those implications for investors and try to stay out of the, the muck? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's, well, you know, this is really, well, first of all, it's the first pandemic in a social media world. Hell. And also, you know, this is like a social media on turbocharge versus where we sure. were in, you know, 2008. So which is which has made the divide uh, so much wider and louder and more toxic. It's really un That's right. unfortunate. I, I just I keep hoping that we're getting to such an extreme that just, you know, the nature 
center of gravity is going to kind of take us back to, uh, you know, a more peaceful environment. We'll see. I sure hope so. I, I sure hope so. Um, it truly is a, a an incredible. Oh, and by the way, for what it's worth, and it was a, the smallest percentage of time, but going back to 1900, the best performance for the stock market has come when a Democrat's been in the White House and you've had a split Congress. Yep. For what it's worth. Yep. So. Yep. This is true. And um, that's fact. That's not, that's not that's me not telling you what I want to have happen in November. That's irrelevant. That's simply what has happened. Um, couple questions. Uh, and, you know, it, it, we kind of hit upon a, a lot of these, but it, 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 uh, the whole tax scenario is, you know, front and center on people's minds. Where, who's paying for what? How, you know, back in World War II, we hit 100% GDP. They raised taxes. I mean, back then, I think it was uh, Eisenhower, I think, raised taxes. We had a 90% tax rate. Now, that was kind of misleading because the average uh, was a 45%. When all the deductions were put in, the people basically paid 45%. Right. But, I mean, how do we, and it's not, front and center, of course, now until we get through this, but there's just no way around not having higher taxes across the board. There's not enough wealthy people in the world to pay for what we have to pay for. But kind of what worries me here is we raised taxes back then to pay down the debt and nobody has said anything about raising taxes yet, but paying down the debt. Uh, I, th their lack of concern about deficits and debt has be that's the one area where there's a heck of a lot of bipartisan support right now. It really is nobody extraordinary. Owns, nobody owns the. Uh, you know, both sides have become fabulous can kickers down the road, that's and sure. we're all sort of as it's been said, we're all MMTers now. Yeah. And so both sides, to some degree, are sort of in, and there are exceptions, obviously, believe that you know what we haven't really faced significant inflation implications of this. And now we've got kind of the Fed on our side, pinning rates at zero and keeping uh, long rates uh, at a very low level too. You know, spend, 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 and maybe we don't even, you know, the right's more likely to say we don't need to raise uh, taxes. You know, the whole view of modern monetary theory is that the only risk of running up deficits and debt like we are is potentially inflation. But if you got inflation, that's when you raise taxes to combat the problem. So, uh, you know, maybe in our lifetimes before, you know, we're not as cognizant of things as we are right now, that we don't sort of have to pay the piper. I don't know. That's certainly our the kids, view right our now. Our kids will be talking to us 50 years from now and saying, what the heck were you guys Except doing? our kids actually in the last four months think that investing in the stock market is their you know, the easy. The Robin Hoodies, as, hoodies, they, as hoodies, they say. Hoodies. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's, that's an interesting thing that differentiates this environment from kind of the late 90s environment. The market sort of captured everybody's hearts and minds in the late 90s across the age spectrum. What's really fascinating in this environment, you see it in sentiment data you know, the behavioral measures of sentiment that capture what these newly minted day traders are doing, small lots in put call ratio and in the options market and what you're seeing in trading in the bankruptcy stocks reflects frothy euphoria on the part of what are, for the most part, much younger investors or traders. Whereas things like the AAII sentiment survey, which is a weekly survey that's been done since the mid eighties, well, the members of AAII generally skew older. And bullishness is way below bearishness in terms of percentages. So this dichotomy is one that is somewhat age-driven. Um, and that is one of the distinct differences between the euphoria we're seeing in certain pockets of the market now and what was universal euphoria back in 99 and 2000. I don't know well, whether that's a good or bad thing. I think it has yet to flesh well, out. Well, anytime the young can, can learn about investing, but, but we're not investing. I mean, right. And I think a lot of it with no sports to bet on, I hate yeah. to say it. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, I, we may have had something to do with free commissions as no, well. And, really. uh, you know, fractional shares or what we call stock slices. Let's see. I just worry about the greed factor. I, I read an interview with a young investor, a college student, who was actually opining on his brethren who 
were getting greedy and, and he was sort of dismissing their greed and said, you know what, I understand that you can't be greedy. I understand the peril of that. And I'm perfectly happy making my 5% a day. And I thought, oh my goodness. Yeah. Please. Wow. Um, so let's just say that we go into another question. If we go into a, a tax mode in the next two years and we, we do uh, hit, you know, 39% or possibly more and, and capital gains taxed at, at uh, you know, in, income rates. Um, what type of vehicles? I mean, you know, the question is, you know, what vehicles would, would, would make sense in that type of a tax environment? Now, obviously tax freeze, if, if rates are still yeah. down, you know, you yeah, might opportunities have tax, in muni tax and, efficiency will be huge. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, low turnover would be huge, correct? Yep, yep. absolutely. And lengthening time horizons. Uh, so I, I think we would sort of maybe force investors to kind of go back to the basics. Uh, Long term? Um, and, you mean focus on things like... When we got into the business, the average hold was five years perhaps? No, I, well, so for me and then I just looked at a long-term chart of this and admit this was back in the 60s it went to and i know back then the average holding period was i don't know like 15 16 uh, years yeah. and now it's five months yeah five months. um and i can't even believe it's that high um uh, well your fr high frequency traders are skewing that big time uh, yeah that that that's I think the average now. trade the average traded stock was held for 22 seconds some crazy yeah. thing Ugh. Well, you know, that, that cohort of investors has time horizons measured in nanoseconds, um, but it has, it, it's not only brought the averages down, but it's to some degree sent, I think, an inappropriate message that, you know, the only way to play this game is to become more tr trading oriented. And, and I, I'm just not sure that's a winning strategy long term because anything can impact the short term in terms of markets. We know in the long term, fundamentals and prices remain connected. In the yeah. short term, you know, all that's I wanna, off. What, what I saw the, uh, two weeks ago with Kodak, I have never seen before. There must have been 12 halts, people just putting open orders in, thinking they paid $30 for the stock, which by the way, opened up at 10, and they ended up paying 60. Yeah. Because they didn't know, they had no idea what a no. uh, limit order is versus an no. open market order. No. And you went from 60 down to 30 like that. And it's a it's, it's a scary it, learning experience. It's, scary, it's sure. scary stuff. And I hope, I, don't, I hope the learning experience doesn't come via a crescendo in the market. Um, I, I hope somehow the learning process can happen over time without a, a, a calamity uh, like a, you know, March 2000 to yeah. October 02 yeah. situation. Uh, one more uh, real quick. Um, the uh, fact that this market, I guess it was up until May, and we kind of touched upon this, that it was basically five or six stocks. Uh, I think uh, the FANG stocks are 23 or 24% of the S&P. Yeah. I read somewhere where the market cap of Apple was 90% of the Russell 2000. Now, being that the, it's almost like between the printed money and, and the fact that there were six stocks running the roost and the uh, equally weighted S&P uh, more broadly is still down for the year. Um, was this just a facade and do we see or do you see that, you know, we're finally going to expand and, and, and broaden this market? So facade, no. Uh, does concentration represent a risk? Absolutely. But I think what this environment actually showed was that there is a pretty small subset of dominant companies that are going to do, that have done extraordinarily well through this unique crisis and stand to do even better. Um, in whatever the post-pandemic world looks like. So you could, you could argue that there's sort of economic justification for this concentration because so much was damaged in the economy. So many entire sectors, again, are facing existential threats that the, the, the concentration of sort of players and industries that not only can survive through this, but will thrive and will dominate where investment and spending is going to be, 
kind of makes intuitive sense. Now, that doesn't mean nothing to see here. Don't worry about that the top five names represent their own quartile. There's, there's always risk inherent with a concentration. But the concentration that exists now has more economic underpinnings based on the unique environment we live in right now than was the case back in uh, 2000. So my hope, and what we've seen recently, hopefully it continues, is that you can correct that at excess through a process of rotation without those stocks coming down and taking the entire market down with it. And the benefit of la lack of participation is that the, the, the kind of froth we're seeing in multiples of those names is not everywhere else in the market. And that's another difference uh, between the, now and 2000. That's is a good point. The, the whole market ended up trading at sort of silly multiples. The silly multiples now, if you want to call it that, are more concentrated. But these are real companies with real profit streams. So, you know, knock, knock wood, uh, we, we, we go through a rotational cleansing of this excess. Right. And, and not, not go to cash uh, as, well, you, as you rotate. Be really, I, I think rebalancing maybe more frequently makes a lot of sense in this environment. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as you know, this is how you manage your business. The whole, I still get questions all the time. Why wouldn't you, whether it's sometimes it's posed, why wouldn't I just get out before the election or maybe it even is an election tide? Why wouldn't I just get out until things calm down and then get back in? Get in and get out is gambling on a moment in time. And investing should never be about right. that. Investing should always be a disciplined process over time. Right. And that's, you, you know, rebalancing keeps you in gear. It forces us to do what we know mm -hmm. we're supposed to do, which is trim into strength, add into weakness. When left to our own devices, especially if we're taking a get in, get out, we often make decisions at the absolute worst time. Yep. Or even trim a little, a, a, a little bit just to make you feel a little bit better. That's fine. But this notion, no one, no one went broke taking profit. Like you said, that's a snapshot in time. And you, you know, you can't time that, but no one ever went broke taking profits along no. the way. Yeah, no, you don't have to make an in or out decision on these names, right. but pair back. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, you, you, you maybe won't be a hero being able to have the bragging rights of I, you know, sold whatever uh, stock at the top and I got back in at the bottom. Yeah. But is that really what investing should be about? That's the old cocktail <laughs> chatter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, look, um, I've. Uh, taking a lot of time here. We it's always been, enjoy this. What, oh, yeah, what this your clients great. probably know is, is we do this when the camera is on and uh, yep. in person or on the telephone. So yeah, 20 years strong, you know, 20 years strong. And we've had these conversations many times when no one's been listening, no one's been watching, but yep. it's nice. It's nice to have your lovely clients. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I Oh, by the way, um, I think everybody should follow Lizanne on Twitter. Uh, if you would like to give your mm -hmm. handle. Yeah, it's just at Lizanne Saunders. And it's, there are some, I've had uh, copycats on Twitter. I've had imposters, but it's at Lizanne, no E at the end, L-I-Z-A-N-N-S-O-N-D-E-R-S. -N -N -E um, and uh, that's, you know, it's the constant stuff that I'm thinking about and doing. Plus I, I also do post, I, I also I, post I, everything that I more traditionally write and record, but Twitter is more the pops into my head, you know, Goes on yeah, the but you, you, you get your, your great charts on there too. And oh, lots of charts. everybody, I, I, of you will be amazed at the charts and the, and the data that, that's there. Um, it's re really very uh, useful and helpful thank you. Um, thank information. You. Thank you. So thank you so much, Lizanne. It was great thank seeing you. Good to see you too. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.